Hello, welcome to an episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. It is a privilege to have Michael Golem here with us today, founder, CEO of Fanvestor, a FINRA-regulated portal uh, for equity crowdfunding deals, tapping into fan bases for sports, entertainment, going to go into all the details here today. Michael, thanks for taking the time to join. A pleasure to be here, Jason. And I, I've always enjoyed our meetings, our discussions. You get to partner with some very exciting groups. So I've been looking forward to today's discussion. But we thought we'd start with your background, your story into the creation of Fanvestor. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Again, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone and uh, excited, uh, excited to tell you a bit more what, what, uh, about our company. So my personal background and my career have taken two companies public. Um, as a CFO, uh, corporate controller, I was a chief financial officer of several public trade companies, both in New York and in London. Um, Stanford GSB grad, CPA. Um, so that's my personal background. Um, as far as far as how the company started, um, as you can imagine, working in capital markets as an operator, not as a lawyer, not as, an, as a banker, but as an operator, I always was fascinated to understand how. Um, to bring regular people like us into uh, institutional quality products. Um, back in 2017, 18, I would say, actually 2018, when I was uh, visiting a friend of mine in New York after my road, another road show and came to his house uh, for dinner, family dinner, I saw on his wall a Green, Green Bay Packers certificate. You guys probably know it's a football team. And I, until then, I did not know that uh, that um, this company is actually public and non for profit. When I asked uh, my buddy Neil why he's an investor, why he's so proud to have this on the wall, he's like, "Well, he says to me, he's like, my ROI is not about putting, uh, you know, making money here, but my the ROI is putting jerseys with my kids on Sunday and saying that's my team." And that really resonated with me, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is pretty powerful." And that's something when I flew back to San Francisco, uh, to my home, um, I read by an accident, Jobs Act changes in, I think, Wall Street or um, it was New York Times, talking about how is now we can bring both accredited and accredited investors into the play, into the retail quality products, uh, kind of like mini IPOs. And since I've been coming from myself from the capital markets space, those the, the star kind of aligned, right? First having this interesting moment learning about Green Bay Packers own, 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 owned by people and how they care more about being part of a club rather than making money, per se, as financial investors. And immediately learning about jobs that changes, how you can bring folks into the play with just a small ticket size, low as 10 bucks. Fast forward, I decided to learn further and I learned about uh, David Bowie, buying back his masters in the 1990s. Um, and uh, end up quitting my full-time job as a publicly traded CFO uh, um, um, and starting this company from the scratch. Uh, uh, fast forward three years into the play, we built, um, um, I'm very proud of, of the team that, that is next to me. Um, very humble to work with some folks like uh, people you know who managed to talk or develop Apple Music, Amazon Music, somebody who closed multi-billion dollar transactions. Um, and uh, with my background in uh, successful IPOs and capital markets, we we built this company that has a full suite of, of regulatory approvals for equity crowdfunding and digital securities. We can legally execute campaigns backed by fractional digital and physical asset ownership, including fractional royalties, debt, and everything else. That's in a nutshell, in a, in a summary of who we are. The company is funded by Stellar Foundation, Formic VC, 7BC Capital, Sukna Ventures, former News Corp chairman, Richard Orr founder, and, and a few other uh, really interesting folks. So, Jason. Strong Second. validation there from the investors who are physically partnered with you. And love the story and the background. Starting at Stanford, you know, the, the, the two company IPOs, the two companies you took public, working as an operator, and then seeing from the investor side that aspect of ownership. And that is such a dream, right? To be able to buy a sports team. I uh, heard Gary Vee talking about sports teams he wants to buy. Everyone knows Mark Cuban and these other owners. 
to be able to have that type of situation um possible to, to retail investors uh, through regulation crowdfunding, through Reg CF, being able to have that type of fractional ownership for, for sports teams, memorabilia, uh, entertainment projects, You're talking about David Bowie, music. It, it, it's pretty revolutionary to think that that's the future that we're going down. And where do you think this whole path is going? What do you think? I imagine you're in all different types of fractional ownership conversations on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what other types of projects, uh, I know you can't speak too much about details, are, are you working on? I just want to paint this picture for the audience of where fractional ownership is going. Absolutely, Jason. So what we try during this, this exercise is to find step and repeat model. Um, I really uh, uh, value what Start Engine Republic, we found her, did for the industry, did a really good job educating everybody and everything we're working with startups, uh, helping to bring investors into um, into the venture community in some respect, the retail investors. What, what we try to work around is that at the end of the day, when, you look, when you're doing a crowdfunding, you're really kind of offering a B2C product. It's a business to consumer. As many of us who have business experience know that typically when you do this kind of, when you have to spend money on marketing, for example, for example uh, or sales and marketing, you spend between 30 to 40% of your revenues to advertise your product to the consumers. Crowdfunding is the same thing. So if I'm marketing this brand new startup without any, any background, I, pre I really need to spend that much money to, to really to convert those folks. The reason why we felt that working with uh, celebrities or, or in sports and music space would be beneficial for all to all parties is because uh, uh, those folks already have an audience. They already have a trusted voice. And their job is to really educate their, their um, followers or their, their uh, supporters of what they're working on. What we notice is that if if, they, if everything done correctly, and Jason, it's more to you to, to talk about this a bit more, it's a, it's a uh, creating uh, um, uh, a place for you to step in, but it's really that the cost of marketing is below 10% when you properly use influencers. So not necessarily influencers to say, hey, I'm I'm just, I was hired to do that, but somebody who is actually a shareholder and says, hey, this is my company, I'm the owner, and, and promoters as, a, as a somebody who has the same interest as an incoming investor. Okay? So that, that that's what that's one of the things that we think it's going to be next trigger to create better economics for everybody. That's number one. Number two, typically what we see that in crowdfunding, even if you have fees to pay platforms or marketing, this and that, net-net, you're getting better valuation, you're getting better results because those folks who are investing, they're, I'm not saying they're not professional investors. Some of them are very smart, but there many of them don't have access to this kind of opportunities and they want to be part of a club. For them, it's more about being part of this journey versus What's my IRR? Am I making 40% or 50% like a professional venture capital would think uh, uh, and things like that. So that's another trend that we're seeing that, that I think it's going to, as, as our industry matures, that's what's going to happen. The third one is really um, um, uh, uh, about, um, and I'm spacing it, I had it in my head in a second. Oh, oh, oh you were asking a question about fractionalization, right? So yes. step and repeat. So, so we see that, um, at least in our verticals, which is in music, music, sports, entertainment, fractionalization of future earnings, like future, uh, like for example, a musician can collaborate with his or her fans with the new upcoming music, uh, um, um, financing versus uh, new, new, uh, for the streaming royalty rights versus um, uh, doing it with a record label company like David Bowie, in David Bowie's example. Where the economics completely is upside down. Just to recollect your memory, uh, David Bowie, when he bought back back his masters back in nineteen nineties, early nineties, he went from losing eighty seven cents in every dollar to a record label company after the expenses were covered of record label company to to simply paying seven point nine percent interest per year, which is unbelievable. That was back in the nineties. It was a centralized exchange in New York, New York, where people had to be accredited investors, things like that. Imagine if we can do the same model, but now through the decentralized world, because in some respect, crowdfunding is somewhat decentralized. Uh, why? Because you're not going through a specific stock exchange. Yes, it's under SEC guidance. 
yes, it's under FINRA for uh, uh, platforms like ours to control. So for the compliance purposes point of view, to make sure nobody uh, nobody creates any issues. But um, uh, um, you don't need to have a PhD in finance or have a right. broker to, to represent you. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the, uh, uh, for this is for the uh, uh, fractionalization of memorabilia, of collectibles. We see uh, what happened last year with the NFTs and digital world. People realized that this model might not necessarily work uh, because at the end of the day, people want something physical. So want to attach to something physical. So we we see that there's a there's a model where many startups are starting in a crowdfunding space, focusing on memorabilia. There are ways to to slice that, but but at some point, that's how we're seeing it. Pass to you, Ben. And those are such great things to point out. I know as a, a marketing agency, when we're speaking to to any issuer across a full spectrum of industries, could be AI, it could be three D printing, could be a bakery or you know some type of local business uh, audience is one of the first things we like to ask about so the fact that you're working with with athletes musicians uh entities with large existing fan bases that that are loyal that they're responsive is huge it, it checks a big box as a marketer if i'm looking at a deal and could say hey there's going to be a social page with three million followers that is going to be making announcements at this frequency maybe we get a one percent engagement rate uh, maybe it's a higher engagement rate but a one percent click through to, to a link and we're getting thirty thousand visitors to an offering page Perhaps a, a 2% conversion, 600 investors comes off of that. Uh, and yeah. even if I had a retail investment size, you know, let's say it's $1,000, which many reg CFs, that, that is the average investment uh, based on metrics on King's Crowd, uh, that, that that could be 600K right there. That could be a good way to, to start out around and then be able to talk about that, showcase it back to the audience, maybe have some other social pages talk about it, uh, pages that do collaboration there often. Quite the opposite of when we're working with a startup that has zero followers, you know, less than a thousand email addresses, uh, primarily first degree contacts versus customers or any type of you know business prospects or, or anything like that. So being able to tap into that audience, like you said, having the validation. Hey, it's a trusted source. This is someone who, uh, you know, has an affinity for the individual, for the brand, for the entity that's posting. So they're they're going to be paying that much more attention. The trust, which the internet typically lacks, digital marketing is largely based on creating that social proof already in place. And then it, it's so fun to think about fractional ownership and where that's going. Again, the idea of owning uh, music alongside an artist. And I was not familiar with those percentages. Uh, I believe uh, I've already talked about it before, but but 7.9% paying out versus getting the opposite. And I've heard of artists getting you know 3%, 3% to split, th things like that. So to be paying out 7.9 is just, it's huge. We talk about disruptive, new, different, for that to be available as the new model, uh, the possibilities are endless on where it can go. Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. And what's another interesting observation is that, and Jason, you probably it would be great to, to hear your feedback on this one is that um, when you're doing the marketing of a startup or a crowdfunding, you typically want to bring in originally like insiders to invest something at the beginning, because nobody wants to be the first one, especially a retail investor, to invest into something they don't know. When it comes to, to, to projects funded uh, or supported by celebrities, people who, and with a good, good uh, background and everything else, people are rushing because they don't want to miss the opportunity. Yes. So this, this, this trigger switches the other way around. But again, it's case-by-case -case basis. It depends on also economy, economics uh, 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 of the deal. It also, the overall economy as a whole. Right now, we are not necessarily in an easy market. Um, where people need to worry about how they're going to pay their rent or or take the kids to school or pay so, so it's it's also touchy touchy situation so it's it depends on the market situation depends on on the project background uh, success in the past if it's a brand new startup or it's actually uh, it's already a business with some history and, and and positive results milestones right like any other business right variables across the board.
And it's not as simple as launch an equity crowdfunding campaign. You're going to see performance. If you look at the metrics, again, again was launched, uh, talking about a platform called King's Crowd. There's several others where you can see all of the live Reg CF campaigns, uh, at least on you know, some of the portals that you were mentioning there, Michael. And it, it uh, it's 50% of the campaigns that are that are bringing on investors, but many are not. It, it's the top 10% that are really moving. Uh, but there's a good volume of them there. And right. if there is a noticeable face, such as the groups that Fanvestor issuers are partnering with or are built around, uh, it, it, it puts them in a whole nother category. Uh, one of the first Reg A Plus campaigns we worked on uh, was with Rayton Solar. Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, was there and in the video. And, and the trust, the recognition, and the caliber of the project seemed that much more um, to levels that interested investors. Uh, I think that's what excites me so much about Fanvestor. And, and as a fan, as an equity crowdfunding enthusiast, um, not just because you're on the show, but because of that concept. I mean, it's largely why some of these vehicles were, were put into place. Uh, and, and as you're saying, uh, to be able to look at what's working, look at what's not, you know, incorporate more uh, of what audiences are responding to, being able to do the next rounds with those companies and at higher levels. Um, it's something that we've been preaching for a long time. And to see a category specific portal versus, hey, this is a portal that is launching one film project, uh, you know, one entertainment uh, platform versus ha having a whole portal built around it to be able to participate in the next deal, the next one, so on exactly. and so forth. Exactly. So if you think about, um, if I were to bring a, ben a benchmark from other industries, uh, when you work in specific in the, in the with in music and sports industry. Many of those folks don't want to be next to somebody else, so mm -hmm. they want to have their own uh, color scheme. They, they really customized white glove approach. Where when you go to our friends' uh, projects, like in the Start Engine Republic or Refunder, there's a lot of cool projects, but they're not next to each other, um, and you're probably not going to find a well-known celebrity-driven project on those platforms because to them it diminishes the brand value. Uh, imagine you are, let's say, Jay Z. I would love to work with him, by the way. Uh, let's <laughs> say Jay Z wants to do a project. There is, probably he's not going to be, uh, he's probably not going to do the project on one of those uh, really good, also really good platforms because he doesn't want to appear next to some some 21st century water producing company, for example. To him, he wants to be by himself. He wants to mm -hmm. showcase his colors, right? Uh, uh, as far as, um, uh, you know, a strategy, everything else. So, when it comes to this kind of projects, we customize. It's kind of like a private label approach, yeah, where you're basically putting them by themselves. And this way, they feel good because many of those celebrities, they also don't want somebody to cross pollinate their audience to other projects, right? And uh, that's also becomes a touch of situation. That's a good point. If uh, the quality control is difficult, by listing alongside other offerings, other issuers on these portals, it, it could potentially turn off uh, the, these larger brands, these larger influencers, faces, celebrities, musicians. Um, so by having their own environment, as you're mentioning there, by having more control of it, they could contribute at a larger level. They feel more comfortable, more, more confident on that partnership. Exactly. And that's how, that's like a, 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 your high quality engine like yours, is, is, is really important to participate from the beginning of the process to help to, to create the story, to create the landing page correctly, to to, read, to, to come up with the right messaging and also the right uh, marketing assets to properly manage and execute a project. So that's, uh, you know, goes a long way with what you guys are working on. So. Yeah, marketing can often be an afterthought on these type of campaigns. And the, the studies show the first two weeks are, are crucial. It should really be the opposite where, you know, test exactly. the waters, compliant pre-launch marketing to be able to get the audience ready to participate in the early stages of the campaign. That that taps into past reward crowdfunding models, but having to live on the equity side uh, and, and being able to, you know, work off a strategy and you know, have an actual roadmap, a blueprint of what the campaign is going to entail, what's being built versus, hey, launch ads tomorrow. I have a few weeks left in my campaign. I need a, a 10x, a 20x return, which uh, 
unfortunately happens quite a bit. And that's part of why we create content around this. We want the best practices to be there. We want to see these vehicles succeed as much as possible. You know, I talk about the future. I envision, I used to say 2025, that's actually rapidly approaching, but 2025, 2030, and the awareness uh, of the ability to invest into private companies, the awareness to be able to buy fractional ownership in the types of entities that you're talking about and how commonplace it can be. Om almost by being a customer, a fan, you could be at that time presented the opportunity to invest as a standard practice. And it seems that you guys are positioned for that future. Absolutely. And then what's, uh, thank you, Jason. So what's interesting is that um, people, people always want something up to date, mature. Let's let's remember our industry started in 2016, right? So it's really not 2012, but when when the Jobs Act was approved, but 2016 when the first rule. It took five years for the SEC and FINRA to analyze, make sure there is no Ponzi schemes and all the issues. This is that, and then they decided to then increase to uh, Reg C up to five million dollars, right? The Reg C plus to 75. It, and it will take time. And I completely agree with your ass assessment. 2025, there will be only what nine, ten years of, of a little kid that just grew up. There will be a lot of things that will be uh, will be uh, lear learnings coming. I mean, people sometimes say, "Oh, I expect a lot from cryptocurrency or from Bitcoin." Bitcoin is also very young, and it's also so. There's a lot. It's when you have a new markets, there will be lear a lot of learnings. Uh, they will take time for the for the true professionals. From the traditional markets to, to join the forces, uh, uh, Jason, you and I probably can can name a lot of cowboys in our space who who uh, would sometimes take advantage of situations, right? And it's the job of of, of uh, companies like ours to to do the diligence of participants and advise properly um, uh, clients to make sure uh, there are no uh, mistakes or quick uh, cash up uh, take uh, off the table approaches, but thinking about how do we train? How do we create investor relations properly? Following the offering, how do we communicate? Because at the end of the day, what's what I personally like about crowdfunding is the fact that you're building an army of your supporters. They're a free marketing team. Imagine you have a thousand people, two thousand participated who invested hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. They're the best marketing force that you can have for free. Yes. All of a sudden, the company, if the company is a B two C company, they can make use that that force, market uh, that team, that cap table. To re-engage and, and 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 amplify uh, the new product introduction, things like that, and that will also drive the marketing expenses down for the future offering of the product. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that is there. Uh, also, would be excited to see how you do enrich, uh, enrichment of concept data, a uh, data enrichment concept, or unpacking who's sitting at your cap table, men versus women, uh, their their investment level, their education level. Uh, if they own real estate, if they, they rent real estate, I mean, whatever, just a lot of things we can actually do with the data companies based on, on understanding of, of the cap table and then use this information to do other things for them. So just a lot of things will, will happen that our industry will, mat will continue to mature. Yeah. And, you know, going back to what you were saying, the earlier part of that peer-to-peer -peer marketing is the ultimate. Everything else is arguably just to create that social sharing. Uh, and as you said, let's go past investment one. What does the IR, the investor relations look like? How do we formulate a better experience for those investors so that they want to participate again and talk about it? Again, going back to the peer-to-peer -peer referral marketing. Uh, we were working with groups that are on their fifth round right now, uh, others that are on multiple rounds, you know, working off philosophies such as always be raising. Uh, there's a lot of utility in these vehicles. So as the issuers get a taste of it, they want to use more and more. I am excited to see more investor success stories over time. Uh, they're already out there, but to be able to say, hey, I bought in at this level five years, 10 years later, uh, this this was what my, positioned, uh, my position was valued at. This is what my exit looked like. Uh, I, I think that is going to bring more attraction into the space as well, too. Saw that happen uh, with digital assets quite a bit. And as it became more real, uh, as it became uh, transferable to, to fiat currencies, and those were used for substantial purchases versus just you know in, in games and things like that in the early stages, it, it definitely started bringing that attraction in. So I, I think that's going to be uh, opening it up. Uh, but you were talking about learnings. You were talking about some ideas. 
uh, in regards to folks listening in, uh, particularly founders, maybe they're involved uh, in some of the projects that you know Fanvestor works on directly. Uh, what would you share with them? to test out. I look at marketing as a series of tests and how important marketing is uh, on these types of raises. Uh, what what should they be looking to incorporate to test out towards their equity crowdfunding campaign, towards their overall growth even? This, this is very, very good and very important question. I think uh, what I would recommend is the following step-by-step -step approach and not try to conquer everything. What I really, uh, so a couple of, a couple of shortcomings I don't know if shortcomings or not to say that, but when it comes to Reg CF, you have a 12 month holding period for trading, right? So um, uh, there's no secondary trading. This, and so, for some companies or, or uh, projects, that is not acceptable. And because they want, they want to create this kind of volume of transaction, things like that, uh, to, to show the success, Jason, what you just mentioned. Until there's a trading, nobody knows if they made money or not. Because at the end of the day, Folks are investors, first and foremost. But in, but at the same time, they're they're participating of, the, of this club of a, of a network and everything else. So that's one that, that to to think about. So before the increase in Rec CF to five million dollars in two thousand twenty March two thousand twenty one, Rec CF was not necessarily as popular. On the other hand, the cost to do either Rec CF Reg A plus were not 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 small, right? And there's a lot of undertake. I mean for Jason, are you and I, uh, you and me to, to, to analyze the compliance? It's our second nature. So it's, but for incoming folks, they don't, they don't, they, they look at it as a foreign language. Uh, uh, you know, that, that's the issue. So what, what we have we seen works is the following. There are specific stages, let's say in, um, in a crowdfunding that requires different, different types, different types of compliance. So, for example, when it comes to Reg CF, if you're making, let's, I'm going to use round numbers. Let's say if you're raising under half a million dollars, I'll just use those kind of numbers. Then you need a, you need a specific type of financial uh, reporting uh, from external CPA or or external accountant. Once you go to, let's say, to million, one million two thirty five, uh, you need to you need to get two years of reviewed financial statements. If you go to next level between a million two thirty five and five million dollars, right? You all of a sudden you need to do audit financial statements for uh, for professionals in the finance space, accounting. When you have a full blown finance team, it's not a big deal. It's it's a it's a walk in the park for for startup founders or even celebrities with their teams. It's it's a big deal. And cost wise, uh, you know, you you reviewed financial statements could cost you a couple of thousand dollars per year uh, based on on, on uh, what really. Well, based on transactions, level of transactions in those companies and, and, and history, you know, complexity of legal structure, things like that. When you go to the audit financial statements level, it could be fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, which you have to pay up front if without even uh, not based on results of your of your campaign. So what I've seen people do now, they try to, like you Jason correctly said, test in the waters. In my case, when I'm saying testing the water, I'm I'm going to say my goal first to hit, let's say, half a million dollars. And if I if I see there's attraction, you know, I'm gonna take my money that I that I that I was able to to raise and invest into getting to next compliance level and update my paperwork with SEC and so on. So in many cases, we see that that the, the, the golden medal is a million thirty-five, right? So you go for that review financial statements. You've spent you know two, three, four, five thousand bucks to uh, to do review financial statements. You pay you know like five to ten thousand dollars for 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 legal support. And then you create a million budget with a company like yours, Jason, right? To 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 to, to do the testing, testing of a lookalikes or things like that. See what sticks, what doesn't work. Exactly the, what you mentioned before. The first two three weeks of of very crucial to test who is my audience, how are we going to reach them, what could be the conversion, and things like that. Based on that, you basically and I just call it hack, right? You basically create a real plan. Once now that you know the real results. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I would go about trying to uh, to to maneuver. I guess you can use the word hustle to and not to spend a lot of money before you know it's going to be successful. Absolutely. You know, I, I get asked about costs and budgeting, and I talk about uh, ten percent being spent on marketing. You know, click through rates, conversion rates. That that being a, a good return, but I but I emphasize that. 
you know, many campaigns do not see that right out of the gate. And you should really look at it as a test. Don't, don't put that level of budget in. Find it as a starting point. We'll have the pacing at a lower level to begin in many cases. So if it's in that test the waters, if it's in the early stages of the campaign as a test, uh, and then you're ramping it up as you're getting the findings, because we always have assumptions going in. Hey, these great names are attached. The product's amazing. But, but until we see the data, until we can say, hey, advertising, outreach, earned media that we're doing as part of our content marketing, it, it's landing. Here is the return. It, it's just an assumption. We, we need that data to show us. So starting with those tests, what, what do you tell issuers or, or what would you if they were in the early stages of the campaign? Uh, below that, you know, 1035, below the different marks that you had talked about, and they're not hitting the traction that they want, or, or maybe they are. They just want to do it in a more rapid basis. They want to do it on a more uh, consistent schedule. Sure. How do you recommend them go about optimizations and an overall improvement of their campaign? Absolutely. Well, first, like I said, um, speaking as, a, as a, from a platform position, we ourselves are independent, but we see a lot of what's going on. So it's very, very important to hire the right partners in your crime, I guess, if you want to call it. <laughs> not, probably not, right, not, not in the right terminology for our purposes, but in your product. Sure. I would, let, me, let, me, let me classify this differently. Um, in the case, uh, I would um, rec- like, um, absolutely important to hire agency before you even sign the contract with, with, the, with the platform, for the agency to provide an uh, um, audit of what, what the company or this entity has, and to provide some kind of game plan. Um, you probably want, depending on how much you try to raise, you probably want at least $25,000, $30,000 allocated to marketing. Um, at least. What's interesting about the model, crowdfunding model, when you are spelling out um, your user proceeds of the campaign, that you're trying to raise, let's say a million dollars. You say, I want to spend 30% on sales and marketing, 40% on operations, and this so much on business development. What's interesting is that you can actually do an intermediate closing uh, of, of a round. Let's say you say, my minimum round is 100,000 bucks. Great. Once you hit $100,000, you can close that. It's called rolling closing, right? You close that amount. The net proceeds after the, uh, the commissions, everything else goes to your account. And then you can take that money and reinvest it back into the marketing of the same campaign. So you don't necessarily say like you, look, you know, if I'm raising a million dollars, do I have to have a hundred thousand bucks minimum in the bank for marketing? No, you probably you probably can start with twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, but you do, but you must have this amount in your in your uh, available to spend because without this amount, uh, to spend, most of which would be spent on let's say advertising and social media paid advertising, content ad, uh, management advertising. Um, um, there is no way to, to tell your story to the people to, to people and explain. So that's that's something I think it's important as people prepare to scale. But there are tools that you can utilize to not to take everything out of your current, uh, current budget, everything else. Did I answer your question? Yeah, finding that starting point, getting the right partners involved. Built, you know, calculating where you need to be, changing up. Uh, for us, I like to add on audience, messaging, the funnel, being able to crack exactly. that code and have enough variance out there. And then as you're seeing what's working, hey, hey now let's ramp it up. Uh, speaking exactly. of which, scale, uh, you've had two, two IPOs. You're working with top tier partners. What, what types of factors do you see consistent in companies that are scaling? Again, this could be in their raise or just towards their overall growth. What are any tips that you can provide t- towards scale? Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's all about the team. You got to have the right team. Without a team, um, nothing's going to happen. You can have the, the best business plan in the world, but without the team, there's nothing that's going to happen who can execute. That's number one. Number two, also, you got to go, when it comes to capital markets, no matter how good your team is, no matter how good your product is, if it's a wrong time, it's a wrong time. And capital markets has its windows. For example, right now, following SVB and other and, uh, uh, Silvergate and uh, other uh, banking uh, regional banks um, um, not doing well in, in the United States, the public markets are not doing well either. So maybe this is not the right time. Sometimes you got to pick the right time to go out because you only have one time to tell your story. Mm. It's like meeting, like meeting somebody. 
Um, and it's it's important. It's very important to to have the right timing. And this is where the agents, you know, marketing agency will come in and tell you, look, now that we completely audit and we understand what your business model is, who you are, we need that. This is required for also for scalability. Um, when you're trying to go after capital markets, if if capital markets is one of your tool tools to scale to get cash, like I said, you need to have those three components. Uh, to, uh, business plan that the, you that, that is scalable itself by itself and it's only only you can say if it works or it doesn't work your team that should be uh the best that you can afford and cannot afford <laughs> um <laughs> uh, and number three the market conditions should have to be the right ones so i'll give you an example the company I took public back in 2006 that was in the london stock exchange um we uh, the ipo was a 2.1 billion dollars we raised a 435 million dollars that was a real estate development, asset management, infrastructure, construction. And that time, market was good. But we also did a good job by doing the right investor relations messaging and things like that. So that's that's important how you do it. Man. So what's also shows the success, after the, our IPO, the company kept, uh, increased to $2.8 billion within the next five, six months. So it's also important to leave something for the investors to make money. The people who initially comes in, you should not milking them all the way um, or, or trying to get as high a valuation as possible. It's, it is perfectly okay to give 20, 30% discount to what you feel is fair to people who give you give you a chance first. By doing that, by showing the success, as Jason were to say in the beginning, showing the success of people making money will create a reputation correctly and everything else for the, and, and then for, for future capital markets exercises. Because important and people sometimes forget the importance of investor relations it's not about telling people only when you have problems help me but you got to keep doing investor relations once a quarter once every few months when you have new product introductions and not just when it's required once a once a year by uh, by the uh, you know for crowdfunding rules so uh, to continue what you were saying jason i think it's 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 a full-time job to to work with investors every day in and out and making sure that they are aware of what's going on inside the company, but at the same time, not too much because you don't want competitors to know too much either, right? So there's a, it's a balancing act. But once you go public, you are public. You, you will tell the whole world about your business plan, more or less. You're going to tell the world, you're going to keep telling the world how well you're doing at least once a year. And um, that's that's kind of um, a couple of uh, things that come to mind from my pre previous experience that can help. Focus on that target audience. Start with your own house. Get the team to the best degree that you can. The product, the storyline around the investment opportunity. But don't just look to place the highest valuation you can on something. Think about how those investors are going to profit, how they're going to be involved in the company during a long timeline uh and, and really by by focusing on them you're you're going to create something that is more favorable for them to to move forward on so you know i i know as a marketer we we can't ever do enough target audience research so a uh, big fan of that answer um it, it's it's i feel like we could talk all day about this uh, about there's, there's overall one, there's, there's one yeah. more i want to i want to to just sorry to please to, to, to run, no. wrap you, but, but think about this from public markets why do you guys think that that some some stocks go up, some stocks go down in, in New York Stock Exchange? Um, a because of performance, of course. B because analysts are following that company and providing some kind of insights why they feel you should buy or sell or hold, right? But also, what's important is there's liquidity that people are allowed to trade. If there is no liquidity, God forbid that one investor who might have financial problems can dump that stock. And there's no buyers, the stock will go will, will, will go down, right? So by having the right investor relations and communication, by creating uh, liquidity for those investors um, properly to, to have more, more of your company in the hands of people than sitting or you sitting with 80% of the company, so only 20%. This will also create some kind of instruments for people to uh, to, to feel good about how that they can they can invest in and in, in liquidate if they need to and that creates some kind of a increase in stock so typically in the ipo process a traditional ipo process 
depending on the company's background, you typically split your cap table between hedge funds and long-term investors. Hedge funds are typically the ones that trade in and out. They're day traders or they're within one year or two years. Long-term funds, like um, uh, they, they typically sit in for 10, 5, 10 years. They invest and they just sit there. So this is this is a game where you need to understand how to create the cap table too. And um, what, what's your minimum ticket size? For example, SEC allows to be ticket size to be as low as 10 bucks. Frankly, I don't know, Jason, if you if you know, but I haven't seen a single project that has ten per ten dollars. What I've seen is like minimum fifty, seventy-five, hundred dollars. Yeah. And because you want, and then some some project says, "No, I want five thousand. Some says, "I want ten thousand. Somebody says, "I want fifty thousand. Why? Because to be basically selecting your group of audience, who's going to be there, what is the investment profile that of that investor, right? And um, so that's also something that that position. But again, it's part of the strategy when you. When you will be working with specific um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, platform and with a, a marketing agency, this is very important to set up all, identify all these rules, so then you get you can win in the future, long term. And we've played around with different entry levels. Like you said, I haven't seen the ten dollar. I've seen campaigns do very well at a hundred dollars. If we're buying advertising, uh, you know, we may look at $300, $500 levels and which audience members would drop off at that point. Uh, there's no one answer for this. It's it's a matter of balance, like you were mentioning earlier, testing, seeing you know, where you're getting the best responses. We have seen minimums change through refilings throughout the campaign, but that, that's not really what you want to do. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a matter of finding the right point and where investors are participating at uh, in real time that day. Like you were talking about, the market's different now than it was in uh, March 2021 uh, when the extensions uh, expansions occurred. So, you know, really have to do the right research, not just go live, but see what's happening in the space today. Uh, talking about all the different groups from the hedge funds, the longer term funds. It's 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 so interesting to see that type of strategic thinking brought into, in many cases, these earlier stage deals or groups using, you know, Reg CF. Uh, but with that type of long term planning, again, going to that investor success and that being the access towards larger industry growth in the future. So uh, excited to hear that. Imagine you have some of those conversations going on in the background of some of your projects. Uh, and, and, you know, for the audience, there's so many things that fan investors working on that uh, I imagine Michael's not able to announce today, but in terms of partnerships and groups that are looking to get involved in the space. Absolutely. 100%. Well, Mike, as I was mentioning, there's, I feel like I could talk to you all day about this. Uh, can make it a full day event and talk about tips for founders. Uh, but as we do begin to, to wrap up the conversation, uh, what would the best way for uh, audiences be to, to get in contact with you, to get in contact with Fanvestor? And any final thoughts, anything you want to leave listeners with here today? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for arranging this exciting event. Um, I truly... Uh, to to like as you know to you and me a lot of things what we were discussing are obvious but for a lot of founders or a lot of folks who are coming into our play it's it's a, it's a foreign territory so yes. um, um, as an entrepreneur with several IPOs and things like that I know how important it is to have the right mentors or right advisors to help you to enter the process and properly align interests of those advisors not just short term but also long term participation that's why. In many cases, we take uh, instead of charging fully uh, um, uh, fee on as far as commission on results, we also take equity in the companies. Uh, not equity, but we take warrants. As a platform, we cannot take equity, but we can. As a result, we can take small portion in, in warrants you know, uh, as a compensation uh, to be independent, but still care about the project. Um, um, started to to see how our industry develops. There will be a lot of wins and lose, you know, losses coming through, especially in tough markets or good markets. If you guys remember when pandemic just happened, this also it, it's in, in reverse to everybody's uh, thought is going to happen. They, it it helped to, for our industry to actually transform because traditional public markets were closed more at the beginning, right? That's why people turned into crowdfunding, and the good companies came in who previously did not even look at the crowdfunding as potential source of funding, right? And they said, "Oh, we're actually successful. We raise capital uh, at the at the good um, at, at good numbers um, uh, with 
with the cost of capital not as high as we we would have done in traditional uh, VC world and things like that. And that kind of triggered. So I completely agree with you that there will be next phase. Uh, uh, there will be industry consolidation, I think, where there will be a lot of players, like you said, you know, start focusing on specific verticals more than just on, on everything. Uh, and that's what you see in every industry. It starts in general terms first, and then it goes slices and dices, right? Geographically and also by, by a specific uh, segment. Um, if, if the folks would like to, to meet, welcome to look me up on LinkedIn, Michael Golump, investor. Let's connect. Um, uh, you can, um, this way, you don't need to remember my email. You can go through there, and we can we can connect, and we can take a take from that relationship to email or call after that. Or my email, if you'd like to write it down, it's m golom g o l o m as in Mary, as in boy at finvestor.com. Thank you so much for for this opportunity, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can't tell you how much I've gotten out of the conversation. Going to be talking with the team about to emphasize. Appreciate you taking the time today. Want to thank all listeners as well, too. And we'll see everyone next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much.